I want to talk about Muhammad and Jesus. And I'd like to talk about Muhammad and Jesus in the light of the theme of rejection. How do you respond to rejection? And what's a healthy way to respond to rejection? We all experience rejection in life. One of the most damaging experiences is being rejected. And it can happen in many different ways. You, you know about that. Um, an Australian couple said the greatest undiagnosed and therefore untreated malady today is rejection. And they, in their, their studies and their writings about this, identified three different responses to rejection. You've been experiencing rejection from somebody in one way or another. Maybe it's abuse, maybe it's ill treatment of one kind or another, maybe they won't talk to you, they insult insulted you, whatever it is. Firstly, you can have an aggressive response. If someone didn't want me, I'll show them. Violence, argumentativeness. The secondly, you can have self-rejecting responses. They said they didn't want me, and they were right. I'm not worth anything. Insecurity, self-pity, self-hatred. You can have self-validating responses. Someone didn't want me, and I'm going to prove that I'm somebody. In their face. They'll have to eat their words. How dare they say I'm nobody? I'm going to prove that I am. They'll have to apologise. And people do that in various ways. Competitiveness, isolation, control, withdrawal. You know, someone offends you, so you, oh, I'm not going to talk to them. No. I'm more important than them. I'm not going to have any conversation with them. So these are three different ways of responding to rejection. Aggression, self-rejection, and self-validation. If you're a Christian, you have no right to live out of these, these, these places. This Christ has carried all your rejection for you. You have no right to take offence. doesn't mean you shouldn't speak up against injustice, you should, but you have no right to be personally living out of this rejection worldview. Because Jesus has set us free from that. I'm going to talk about that. Why Islam is, for Islam, rejection is a really big issue. Two leaders of Jesus. They both experienced a lot of rejection, and sometimes in remarkably similar ways. Muhammad made his way into history with empty hands and in a hostile society. This is Ali Dashti, an Iranian intellectual. Jesus, according to Isaiah in his prophetic text, said he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. And there's a, a demonstrator saying that the prophet is the greatest man that ever lived. But how did he respond to rejection? Let me tell you the story of Muhammad's life. Before he was born, Muhammad was supposed to be sacrificed. His father made a vow in which he would sacrifice one of his sons if certain, something happened. And um, his, no, no, Muhammad's grandfather made a vow in which he was going to sacrifice one of his sons. And Muhammad's father, Abdullah, was the one who drew the straw, the short straw. Uh, and, but there was an intervention, and instead the grandfather sacrificed 99 camels, so the father survived. But then it turns out that Muhammad's father died before he was born. And there's a very interesting issue in Islamic sources. Some say that he died a couple of years before Muhammad was born. And it's an incredible miracle that Muhammad stayed in his mother's womb for a few years until he was born. That is actually attested to in Islamic sources. And so later people accused him of being um, illegitimate. And he said, I'm not illegitimate. And I've never been illegitimate. All my ancestors were not illegitimate, all the way back to Adam. We'll come on to that later. Anyway, he was fostered out by his mother, which is a common practice amongst the Arabs, so he didn't actually have much knowledge of his mother. Uh, and then he was orphaned at six, and his father was looking up, grandfather was looking after him, then his grandfather died. Um, and then he was brought up in a pretty low, low position in, in his uncle's family, and was rejected and insulted by his wealthier relatives. Now that's already a fair bit of rejection. And disappointments. You can be rejected sometimes just by losing people who should be loving you. You know, many orphans feel rejected. Like, where were my parents? What, what, what has happened to me? Why didn't they love me? Why did they go? What's happened? So he had a rough start. And this is a, a verse in the Quran where Muhammad's speaking about his uncle, 
who's called Abu Lahab, or father of the flame, I think because he's destined for hell, according to Muhammad, perish the hands of Abu Lahab, and perish he, his wealth avails him not, neither what he's earned. He will roast at the flaming fire, and his wife, the carrier of firewood, upon her neck a rope of palm fibre. So Muhammad is describing his uncle in hell, and his uncle's wife, his aunt, is carrying firewood to burn him. So that's a pretty disturbing thing for your nephew to say about you. And his, wife, his aunt came back and, and made this little poem, and he said, um, she said something like, We reject the reprobate, his words we repudiate, his religion we loathe and hate. So Muhammad experienced some rejection from his family, and he rejected them as well. He was married at 25 to an older, wealthy woman. He, he was her third husband. And in that culture, men were very dominant, and to be married to someone much more powerful to yourself is a fairly demeaning situation for a man to be in. In fact, she had to get her father drunk, according to Ibn Ishaq, in order to marry Muhammad. And after the father realised what had happened, he was really annoyed about it. And then he had other disappointments. Three or four of his sons all died young. And when he began preaching his religion, most of the early converts were slaves, servants, um, and a few demons also. Jinns became Muslims as well. But it was actually pretty rough, the early stages of the Islamic faith. The Muslims became a despised minority in Mecca. Um, they came to his, his uncle and said, Your nephew has cursed our gods, insulted our religion, mocked our way of life. Either you must stop him, or you must let us get at him. They're asking permission to kill him, basically. But the uncle kept protecting Muhammad. They instituted an economic and social boycott against the Muslims. A Muslim slave called Bilal was tortured by his owner and mocked. And Muhammad was mocked. He was called, instead of being called Muhammad, he was called the Dhamman, which means a reprobate, bad person. Dirt and intestines were thrown on Muhammad. He sought help from leaders in nearby towns, in other towns, but they rejected him and they mocked him. They said, you must be just so important if you're Allah's messenger and if you're so important, there's no way we could ever possibly meet with you. And then someone else said, well, shouldn't Allah have counted someone better than you to be his messenger? So they sent him away and he was, he was rejected. How did he respond to this weight of bitter experiences? Firstly, he doubted himself. He wondered whether he had a demon, literally, in the, in the account of his life. He, he, he had suicidal thoughts. He went up to a hill to throw himself off. There's a Satanic Verses episode where he made up some verses that praised the pagan gods, and then the, the pagan Arabs began to like him. And his followers said, Muhammad, what are you doing? And then he said, no, 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 Satan led me astray. But he said, it's okay, because... All the prophets have been led astray by Satan at some time. That's a self-validation, okay? And um, people would say, you're crazy, and he'd say, when you're in hell, you'll see who's crazy. And he would validate himself. People said, you're just a shepherd boy. He said, all the prophets have been shepherd boys. You've been led astray by Satan. Well, all the prophets have been led astray by Satan. That's a sign that I'm a genuine prophet. And then the Quran says, you have a tremendous nature. So what's happening here is that Allah tells Muhammad, according to Muhammad, that he has a fantastic character. And he tells his friends, you need to know that Allah says, I'm an amazing person. So that's self-validation, really, isn't it? You say I'm mad, but God says I'm amazing. If you had a pastor who was saying stuff like that, you'd be concerned about him. Or you ought to be, anyway. And so there's self-validation. And then he responds with aggressive words. He says that those that are criticizing him will roast in hell. And then when they're, they're later, they'll, they'll, they will be confronted and they'll be told, you know, you said Muhammad was alive, but look where you are now. And believers in paradise will be laughing at unbelievers roasting. And um, then he also threatens the people who are criticizing him. He says, I'm going to kill you. And then he flees to Medina. He also shows really strong perfectionist characteristics, which is another form of, of response to rejection, self-validation type response. The Quran says it's not for any believer, man or woman, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter to have a choice in the affair. He's basically saying, I speak for God, and once I and God have decided on a matter, there's nothing more to be said, so just be quiet and do what I tell you. 
There's the story of his foster son, Zaid, and, his, and, and Zaid's wife, Zainab. At one point, Muhammad took a liking to Zainab, and when the foster son realized that, he divorced his wife, and Muhammad married her. And, um, and then the Quran says to him, uh, the Quran, Allah says this, he said, says to Muhammad, you told Zaid, keep your wife to yourself. But when you told Zaid that, you were hiding what God had showed to you that really Zainab was for you. And you were frightened of other people. You were a man fearer, Muhammad. And you, you had to speak out and say that you wanted, to, you wanted Zainab. Um, and when Zainab had divorced her, then, then we, Allah, gave... Um, sorry, when Zaid had divorced his wife, then we gave his wife to you in marriage so that there wouldn't be any mistake amongst the believers and they would know that it's permissible to marry the wife of your adopted son. So you are, you are an example for that. And God's commandment must be performed. So there's a really interesting story that Muhammad suddenly had a desire for his son's wife and the son divorced her, and then Allah tells him that he's doing the right thing. And actually, as a result of this incident, Islam prohibits adoption. It's illegal to adopt children in Islam. It becomes part of Sharia law, the consequence of this, um, this, this experience. It's a very controlling way of dealing with your, your, your community. Validating, self-validating as well. Other strange and disturbing incidents involving remarkable control over people's lives... There was a man and a woman who were, um, there was a woman who had a man in the house um, and she said, look, the clothes, the, the restrictions on clothing are very difficult. This man's not a relative and I have to be covered up all the time. Can't you relax that a little bit so we, you know, the, the, you know, we can have a more reasonable life. In, in, in Sharia law, a woman has to be um, covered up except with fairly close male relatives. And if you have someone in your house who's not a close male relative, you have to be constantly, you know, covered all the time. So this woman went to Muhammad and complained about this. And he said to the woman, if you, if you breastfeed the man, even just once, then he'll be your, your um, you'll, you'll be like a foster mother to him. And then he's your son. So then you don't have to be covered up all the time with him. And there was a case recently in Egypt where two people were working together in the workplace and they asked for some assistance about the dress code and um, a cleric said, yes, so the woman can get the man to suck on her breast and then they'll, she doesn't have to cover up because he's like her foster son. And um, this caused an uproar in the Egyptian parliament that people were so ashamed and upset and angry that this had been made a ruling, even though it's well attested in the life of Muhammad. But the point I wanted to make is that this sort of story reveals a remarkable um, capacity to control people's individual lives. Another case, a couple have been divorced and they came back to Muhammad and wanted to remarry. And he said, she can only remarry if she marries someone else, has sex and gets divorced, and then she can remarry her first husband. And that's actually the law in India, for example, for Muslim women, not for Hindu women, because the British gave Sharia law to the Muslims before they left India. And... Um, so that's a very controlling thing to, to do to people. Uh, Muhammad wanted to discourage people from um, divorcing too lightly, basically. He was punishing them, for punishing them, the, the, the couple for the man divorcing the wife by making the wife have sex with somebody else. He married Aisha at the age of six and consummated at the age of nine. Aisha was the daughter of his best friend. Um, later, Aisha was accused of adultery and Muhammad made a rule from Allah that you have to have four witnesses uh, in order to prove adultery. And one of the consequences of that is that if a woman is raped in Pakistan and she complains to the police, if she can't find four men that have seen the rape and are willing to testify, then she could be accused of making a false accusation of rape. And there are lots and lots of women in Pakistani prisons because they've reported a rape to the police. This is a result of Muhammad's dealing with complaints about his young wife's infidelity. So these are very controlling ways of dealing with people that become embedded in Islamic law and affect the lives of millions of people today. Um, so Muhammad flees from Mecca where he's been opposed to Medina and he establishes a principle of fighting against non-Muslims, the jihad. They bound themselves to war against all and sundry for Allah and for his apostle. 
And the Quran says that permission is given to those who fight because they're wronged. It says persecution is worse than slaughter. Fitna is the term in Arabic. Fight on other people until there's no more persecution of Muslims. And I'm going to take you down to uh, this comment by Ibn Kathir, his commentary. He said, Allah indicated that non-Muslims are committing disbelief, associating with him, that is, they're worshipping other things apart from God, and they're hindering other people from following Islam, hindering from the path. And hindering disbelief, committing disbelief, is much worse and more disastrous than killing. So he said, to, to hinder someone from being Muslim or to disbelieve is much worse than murder. So the Quran says, fight them until there's no more disbelief, no more fitna. Uh, this is a violent, aggressive response to rejection. This actually, this worldview of rejection is embedded in the attempts by an organisation like the, organize, the Organisation of the Islamic Conference or or cooperation it's called now, to ban critical speech on Islam throughout the world. And they want to do that um, in every jurisdiction. They've, they've put motions before the UN in terms of defamation of religion uh, to try and make it illegal to, to denigrate Islam or denigrate the Prophet, any kind of criticism. It's, it's driven from this idea of preventing any kind of fitna. Okay, here we go. Muhammad. He has his, he's rejected, he has a really tough life. You know, if, if, if I was praying with someone who had a life like Muhammad, they'd need a lot of prayer ministry because there'd be a lot of pain associated with all those experiences. And he responds firstly with self-rejection, doubts himself, thinks of suicide, then self-validation. All the prophets have been like this, you know. God says I'm amazing. And then these aggressive responses. Kill those who don't go my way, who won't believe, who reject and so he shows all of the worst, all of the negative responses to rejection. He's like a walking rejection bomb. And his attributes, these characteristics, get embedded in Islamic law. And they replicate through culture after culture. Because it's, Muhammad's the best example. And when you declare that, you spiritually bind yourself to him. It's like saying, his demons be my demons. You know, his faults be my faults. And this is a serious spiritual problem, a serious spiritual issue. Now, you've had a, a quite a bit of unrelenting gloom, and uh, I'd like to um, just move on. He, yeah, he initiates a genocide against the Jews who rejected him. And Muhammad, the rejector, rejected once, becomes the great rejector, and the orphan becomes the maker of orphans. Let's talk about Jesus. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, um, he, he was rejected, like, a lot. He had a lot of rejection. He was, there was the stigma of illegitimacy. Instead of being born in a stable home, he was born in a stable. Uh, he, Herod tried to kill him. He became a refugee in Egypt. He was opposed by religious leaders. His authority was questioned in very credible ways. He was called satanic. You cast out demons by Satan's power. He was accused of being a liar. His own family tried to throw him off a cliff. His own village people, the people he'd grown up with, tried to throw him off a cliff. If you went home to visit your people and they tried to throw you off a cliff, you would feel rejected, I believe. <laughs> Just a little bit. A crowd tried to stone him. His own followers deserted him. Peter denied him. Three times. He was betrayed by one of the twelve. The crowd bade for his death. He was falsely charged by Roman and Jewish tribunals. He was mocked, he was abused, he was sentenced to death, tortured and crucified. That's a lot of rejection. Matthew 12. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smouldering wick he will not snuff out until he leads justice to victory. How does Jesus win justice? How does the rejected man win justice? He wins it through incredible gentleness, through spiritual power, not through worldly power, not through murder, not through self-validation. Jesus, when he healed people, this passage occurs in a context where it says Jesus is healing people and telling them not to tell others. So Jesus is not trying to validate himself. 
Oh, please tell a lot of people that I'm an amazing healer. No, that's quite the opposite. He actually chose the opposite. Don't tell anyone. Just go home. See the priests. Enjoy life. He embraced rejection. Blessed are you when, you when people hate you, he said. He rejected violence, saying, put your sword away to his followers there in the garden. Love your enemies. It's really interesting to love your enemies. Um, cultures that have, that have become influenced by the teachings of Jesus make a clear distinction between people and the beliefs they hold. So you can love someone while rejecting what they stand for. Like, I can love my enemy, but not accepting the hatred they have towards me. And that means that if you're, if you're a scholar, you can disagree with someone without punching them in the nose. And um, uh, Salman Rushdie said he loved his studies, I think it was in Oxford or Cambridge, because he learned that you could completely disrespect someone's beliefs and ideas in the sense that you disagree with them or think they're wrong, but without disrespecting them as people. You could argue with them and have a serious debate about ideas without rejecting people or being violent to them. When I say disrespect, I mean disagree with them. This is, this is the ethic of Jesus. It's an influence of his teachings, love your enemies. And this understands, I said Christian, but it's really West, uh, I said Western, but it's really Christian understanding of freedom of speech. You can't defame ideas. You can only defame people. It's people that need to be respected. But as far as telling the truth is concerned, we should be free to tell the truth. This distinction is not recognised in Islam. We have a case in Melbourne where um, some pastors were accused of vilifying Islam and Muslims. And part of the, the case of the Islamic Council of Victoria that brought that was they said it is not possible to make a distinction between Muslims and our religion. If you insult Muhammad, you are personally attacking us. And they wanted the courts to rule on that basis, that there's no distinction between the teachings and ideas of Islam and their identity as individual Muslim people. It was such a challenge, really, to a, a very long tradition um, of, of law. Well, Jesus taught about this. He taught about how to respond to rejection, and his disciples were deeply impacted by it. They were changed by it, and they speak about it in their letters. Peter says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So this is Peter who, who, who denied Jesus three times and was then appointed by Jesus to be a leader of the church. This is, Jesus, this is Peter who was not there when Jesus was at his worst point. And he was deeply impacted by the example. He says, we should follow in his steps, as Jesus was. As he dealt with rejection, so we should as well. We've actually been healed by his rejection, by the wounds that he experienced for us. By his death is our victory. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I think I've lost that. Anyway. Here's from Philippians, Philippians 2, 4-10. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. So Jesus didn't vindicate himself. He didn't try and validate himself. He humbled himself, but he was vindicated by his Father. He was vindicated, but not through self-vindication or self-validation. Uh, John writes about this, a ministry to others in Christ. Our ministry to others in Christ he says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. 
We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So what John is saying is that his example should be our life as well. The way he dealt with rejection is meant for us, that we should live this life as well. Uh, It's really fascinating that, that Jesus defeated rejection through the cross. That, in a way, by embracing rejection, the cross actually sets us free from rejection. The power of evil to determine who we are and what we are is broken because of what Jesus did. Actually, the cross is the answer to the rejection of Muhammad. You have these two people incredibly influential in history. One is rejected and defeats it, and the other is rejected and shows all the worst attributes of of a self-destructive response to rejection that gets replicated throughout the religious structure. So that's why the cross is the answer to the the problems of Muhammad's life. It's very sad, actually, because some Muslim societies are very damaged by rejection. Um, You'll see uh, this sense of victimhood, self-victimhood, that's reported in some context by Muslims. And if you ever do witnessing and sharing your faith, discipling of people coming out of Islam, they usually have, they often have serious rejection issues. They'll quickly feel rejected. Um, They'll be very sensitive to criticism of Islam. That's taken as a personal rejection, but not just in that area, in other areas as well. I had the pleasure of leading a congregation of about 100 people who've left Islam to become uh, Christians in the last three or four years from an Iranian background. And we teach and disciple very intensively in this area of not responding to rejection with offence or self-validation or competitiveness, but encouraging people to actually absorb what it means to be like Jesus and to know that the freedom we have in Christ is because of the way he was victorious over rejection by showing a different way to us. I sometimes also say that um, if you want to work amongst Muslim people, it's really helpful if you don't have too many rejection issues yourself. Because you're going into a situation dealing with it like a stronghold that's all about rejection. And if you're easily offended and have hair-trigger responses to criticism, then you will find that all being arced up and kind of come into play in those contexts. You need to be a model of peace and not take offence and, um, and be gentle and not aggressive and be gracious. It's good to get healing for that. The other thing I wanted to say, which I didn't say earlier, is that I mentioned those three responses to rejection, um, aggression, self-validation, self-hatred. If someone is really badly affected by rejection, they can show all those attributes at the same time. They can hate themselves, be aggressive to other people and try to prove themselves all the time. It's very sad to see. But Jesus came to set us free from that. And we get set free from it when we realise that he's taken all the rejection on himself and we don't need to carry it anymore. We don't have to validate ourselves because he has justified us. We don't need to be aggressive because God is the just judge and he will deal with everything. We don't need to hate ourselves because God loves us and he has shown his love to us through Christ. And living these principles, actually having these this freedom in your life is one of the most compelling things that you can offer people who come from an Islamic background to help them find a new way of thinking about their emotional health. 